I'm happy to see you all. My name is Kuba, and with Petr and his previous presentation, we are representing Czech Republic here on this conference. Uh, as an introduction, I'd like to s uh, say that this presentation will probably be the most uh, low-level presentation at this conference, but I still think it's, uh, it contains a lot of uh, ideas and um, that, uh, that it's not completely a technical presentation, so I think that even if you are concerned about the high level of security, you will at least find this presentation useful. Um, uh, I would first like to do a quick survey. Can I please ask you uh, who is an iOS developer here? Okay, so about a half, maybe. And the rest of you are mobile developers for other platforms, right? Who's an Android developer? Okay, the other half. Uh, Tizen developers? None? Great. Um, okay. My presentation is called The Dark Side of iOS, and I would like to uh, start with a few, few areas of um, software engineering and software development. The like objective oriented programming, functional programming, and all these other stuff. I guess if I asked you a question of how important it is for any developer to know about these areas, it would create a great, uh, great discussion, and there will be as, as many, um, as many opinions as there are uh, people in the audience. But uh, I would like to uh, introduce or tell you about an area called reverse engineering, which I believe is not as common and not as much known as uh, all the, ar all the ar other areas of software development. And again, I would like to ask you, uh, how many of you have ever heard the term reverse engineering? Okay, everyone, that's great. Uh, how many of you have ever tried to do some reverse engineering? Okay, like 60%, great. Uh, how many of you have actually used it for some good purpose, like for your uh, work, or how many of you do you use it in work? A few hands, like 10. How many do you, of you do you make your living on reverse engineering? None, so that's great. That's the, re that's the best audience I wanted. My presentation is going to show you some uh, some stuff, and some things. I'm going to talk about various areas of of security, mostly on iOS, and I will do a slight comparison with Android. And I will talk about mostly about uh, the Apple um, Apple community and the Apple platform and iOS. But I guess. Uh, it will also be uh, a nice thing to see how these things work, even for you guys who aren't uh, iOS developers. I will be talking about private API, which is a uh, kind of, uh, I say, that these are forbidden questions because everyone wants to know the answers, but there really are no good answers from Apple because uh, it's private API. It means, it, from the Apple's perspective, it doesn't exist. You don't. He, uh, it doesn't want you to know about it. It doesn't want you to use it. And I'm going to uh, provide some. I'll try to provide some answers about these these subjects, like uh, app validation and app re review, which Apple does for every application that you submit into the App Store. And I'm in the in the last part of my presentation. I'm going to show you the binary structure the actual uh, the actual outcome of your of your application projects when you compile it and show you how what what exactly can you see in the binary structure what can and it also means what can the attacker see or some uh, or uh, for basically any other guy who can who wants to find any information from an app So I basically said all these points that this is what what the uh, what the presentation is about. Um, there are a few disclaimers about this. I don't want to uh, present myself as a, as a security expert, as the <laughs> introducer said. I'm really just uh, someone who likes to uh, break stuff, dig into stuff, and find how things work because I think the understanding of how um, the system, the OS, 
and the whole platform is implemented is really useful even for um, standard purposes for development because when you understand things you can write a better code. Let's talk about the app Sandbox or uh, the sandbox that is present on all iOS devices and that, uh, that is the main mean of uh, Apple's security enforcement. Uh, as you probably know, every, every iOS application that you have on your phone, on your standard non-jailbroken phone uh, or iPhone, sorry, I will be probably mixing the terms phone and iPhone because this presentation is probably on base, uh, focused on iPhones. Uh, this sandbox means that every application can only see its directory and a few, really few system directories. And if it, uh, as, an, as a phone, it does have a file system, uh, Unix-based, and uh, the, uh, any application can try to mm, go through the files and the directories, and it can see uh, mostly only a part of the file system, which, which basically means that uh, if you are an Android user, you usually have some kind of file manager app on your on your device, which is really great because you, as technical guys, you want to manage your files and directories and to, to copy documents between applications. But on iOS, you can do this. the 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 reason is because of the sandbox, and I believe I personally believe that this is also the reason for. Uh, that iPhones do not have um, Bluetooth file sharing and many other areas that users are asking f uh, f Apple to implement, but they simply don't do this because they don't want to break the sandbox. Once you start, uh, once you allow file, file management outside of application sandbox, you will, you will break the sandbox and this is something that mm, has a lot of security consequences and simply Apple believes that the way it's done, it's better than than the than to it's it's better not to implement these features. Also, when you want to transfer documents between applications, you can't you can't do this without the other applications' consents. You have to you have to allow allow the transfers specifically for for each application. I'm going to talk about the jailbreak. Uh, of you iPhone users, how many of you do you have jailbroken phone? Better you don't have? Okay, you told me, you know what you told, every iPhone developer must jailbreak their phones. I don't have it either. <laughs> um, when you jailbreak your phone, you basically break the sandbox. This is one of the, the, the reason for Apple not to, th th that he tries to fight um, jailbreaking, that he tries to make it as difficult as possible, is basically because they don't want to break the sandbox. And this is the consequences that it, that it creates. Basically, every, any application can read and write anywhere in the file system, which uh, itself is, the, is, is a great threat. It creates space for malware. Uh, and it basically makes my mal mal writing malware, malware at as easy as possible because uh, then there are there are no no uh, user accounts. Every application is run in the same same space, same uh, s with the same privileges, and it actually uh, makes a lot of things like uh, debugging and attaching process possible. With these, I'm going to show that. Um, Basically, m malware has unlimited access to to your phone, and of course, Cydia. Cydia is the best thing that uh, that uh, jailbreak users have because it installs applications and has a separate separate store for applications. Many of these are um, stolen, so you don't have to pay for the applications. But also, there are plenty of applications that uh, are regular. There are normal applications. But they just uh, work for, uh, for Cydia only because they use some features that are not available in the standard SDK. Or they use private API. Jailbreaking a phone uh, is usually uh, done by guys like Stefan Esser. You, I, I think you've probably heard about him. 
uh, and these other hardcore developers who who I who are investing an enormous amount of time into developing, uh, finding and researching exploits. And there are two types of jailbreaks that are usually published. One is called tethered, the other is called untethered. The difference between those is that uh, untethered jailbreak uh, is removed once you restart your phone. So basically it means it's an in-memory jailbreak only. And I have written on the slide that it's easy to uh, to have a to research a jail uh, that the jailbreak, uh, s but the easy is really really relative. It means uh, it's it's really hard to do this if you don't have the proper knowledge and the proper um, pr if you haven't done the proper research. But compared to untethered jailbreak, it's it's easy because. For a tethered jailbreak, all you have to do is find an exploit to get into the kernel. That's one layer you have to you have to pass. That's one uh, one vulnerability you have to find. But to have an untethered jailbreak, it takes this. This is the list of vulnerabilities or errors or mm, exploits that are used for the iOS 6.1 jailbreak called Evasion. And if I count correctly, uh, does anyone know how I can get rid of this? Sorry? Pick somewhere and it should disappear. Uh, doesn't work on the X? No. It will close the presentation. OK, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, yeah, now it's. I think that <laughs> these there are tw 12 vulnerabilities. Uh, and all of them are really weird. These are not typical vulnerabilities because the layers of s of of the system that you have to break are really different from a uh, desktop computer. For example, I'd like to mention this one called Shebang Trick. Uh, it's it's a really cool exploit because it doesn't actually exploit any vulnerability in the system. Uh, and most of these exploits depend one on each other. So, for example, I believe that most of these exploits are not fixed. The evasion uh, exp uh, jailbreak will not work on iOS 7. But all that Apple does was to fix one of these and the whole exploit is not working anymore because they don't they these exploits depend one on each other. I'm going to talk about the pri private API that Apple uh, that that there is on iOS. Developers would like to use it because often you will find uh, a feature that just is there and just isn't available, and you would like to use it. And the private API is just a, an unpublished class or unpublished method that you can find using this tool called Class Dump. Uh, about the links in there, I will be publishing the slides on uh, on SlideShare after the presentation, so you don't have to take photos on anything. Uh, also, I want to say that if you have any questions, you can just interrupt me as well as so. Just raise your hand, and I will give you the word. This tool, Class Dump, is <laughs> really a great tool because it shows what uh, it shows quite exactly what you can really find in a binary. I'm going to show you. Not this tool exactly, but another one uh, in the later of the presentation. And I guess uh, I think it's it's really nice to have a look into the application binary because uh, I mm, I think that not many developers are actually using reverse engineering and taking a look in their uh, in their result of the compilation. Because it's it's something that doesn't usually fit in a standard development process. This is something that Peter was talking about at his at his previous previous presentation called method swizzling, which is a a method or a technique to to switch implementations of methods, and it's really easy to do. Yeah, this is this is the code that does it, and actually these these three or these two um, these two methods uh, or procedures are standardly available in the iOS SDK, and this this actually is not private epic. You can you can 
call use these these methods just as you want and this is one of the technique that is usually or that is used to use some private API or some method or to 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 uh, exchange exchange implementations of some method if you have a class that is that that uh, that has this uh, public API but it, it doesn't fit into your uh, into your idea you can just use this to exchange exchange implementation this this actually uh, this is a method this this, this what this does is uh, it takes the synchronized method on on the object that it's in so on self and exchanges its its implementation with the swizzled synchronized method and the funny thing is that when you called the swizzled synchronized inside the the implementation you actually call the original because now this this name means the original so because it switches switches the two implementations also the to to do this this probably is implemented in a category in iOS which mean which allows you to uh, extend objects and you can with this technique you can even extend uh, methods or extend classes that are not your own that are from frameworks and even private private classes as well <coughs> uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about app review and app validation process at Apple because it's something that has a lot of question marks about it uh, and there is probably not there is not not many information about these these things in the Apple docu Apple official documents so uh, one of the most popular questions is what exactly is sent over to Apple when you when you hit the validate or publish button in Xcode so the answer is quite easy because you can check it for yourself because w all you all you submit is an Xcode archive which you can build separately then you can uh, delete the whole project or the source code and then you can hit the, the publish or validate button so you know no nothing else than the Xcode archive is submitted to, to, the, to Apple and you can examine, examine this, uh, this directory called Xcode archive and what you'll find in this is the binaries for for the devices only you won't find there any source code you won't find there any binary for simulator which uh, which basically means that uh, in the Apple validation or app, app review they don't actually have a mean to run your application on the simulator which is quite an interesting fact what what happens with the app during validation uh, some boring stuff and then they check for private API usage uh, another popular question is how d how do they do this how do they check for private API usage and then yes yes I forgot to mention this yes they do the, the debugging symbols but I personally I I haven't tried it but I believe that if you strip them you will still be able to submit the application the checks for private API uh, it's something that sounds sounds cool how do they do this it's simple they they, they fake it they just take your application and uh, they will run it to some automated tool which will uh, look take a look at the at the import sections of the binary and uh, at the selector table and they will just find find all names of your of your selectors that you use in your applications and if they find some some name that uses a private API uh, they will um, reject your application from validation yes You mean uh, like loading a library on runtime and uh, using a class or method by not statically linking it inside the binary, but by dynamically? No, no yes, no, yes. No, uh, this is one of the technique to avoid detection of private app usage, and probably they will not discover it. Uh, sorry, again, the answer is they will not discover it during an app validation 
but if the private app you use is obvious in the application, it will, it will not go through the app review. Because they, they also, this is the next slide called app review, and this is one of the things that um, I think is the most interesting part of this, because this, is thi this, this section is my guess, what, ha what really happens. There is no official information. I don't work for Apple, I have no idea what they really do, but officially you have, you have absolutely no idea what they are going to do with your application. They only have the App Store Review Guidelines document, which uh, kind of states what you can or you, or you can't do, but the, if I, ha I don't know if you have read it, but uh, there, there is, it's, it's a lot, lot relative and uh, a lot of subjects for, for discussion, what really is allowed and what isn't because the, the items are quite, mm, uh, it, they are not exact. They, they say, for example, basically the guidelines say, if we don't like your app, it'll, it will be rejected. So you really don't have any, uh, mm, you, you don't really know if your app is going to pass the review unless you do. I personally believe that the human human testing of your application uh, is really not extensive. It's really just a few a few I guess a few minutes of work with your application. I believe that what they actually do is that they just try it if it runs, if it doesn't crash, they just try a few features and that's it. If if all the other automated tests like validation or CPU load is fine, they will accept your application. And I personally believe, and I have some um, vague experience with this, that uh, they they just don't solve m uh, they just don't solve the problems uh, during validation. They solve them once once the application is popular enough that someone cares, because they Apple can reject application uh, later or retroactively, and this th I think this is the process that they actually do to uh, to solve. Uh, violation of the rules. And also I'd like to mention that individual teams that do uh, the application reviews, there are, uh, I think th this is almost an official information that there are many separate, separate teams who do app reviews and the teams can have different results. I personally know uh, that one of my application was was rejected first time. Then I had did no changes. Submitted it at another time, and it passed. Larry. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's your experience, right? Yeah, I one team was in India, other one was in the United States. Yeah, that's w great. <coughs> I'm going to talk really quickly about the app encryption because uh, when you download an application from the App Store, uh, what you really get from the Apple servers is an encry encrypted binary, which is encrypted using a technology called fa Fair Play. Uh, there really isn't much information about how the encryption really works. Uh, I, th I think that uh, every device has some kind of hardware key or I, r I really don't know if it's, if it's a, a private key or public key or how exactly this works. I know it's documented in a, in a book called mm, uh, iOS Internals or I think it's called macOS and iOS Internals. It's a, it's a great book. and. Uh, you can easily detect encryption in an in a in a, an iPhone binary b with this tool called All Tool. It also has the capability to disassemble a binary, and this Crypt ID one means that the binary is encrypted, and it also means that the uh, and I uh, I also think that the binary is encrypted differently each time you download it from the App Store. It's encrypted for. I think your Apple ID, so if another user downloads, downloads the same app, it will be encrypted differently, which also makes, makes it uh, quite hard to actually decrypt the, the binary. This is how it looks uh, in 
uh, in a software called uh, IDA. When you open an encrypted binary, binary this, uh, this should, in an decrypted binary, be some ARM assembly. But actually, I don't know uh, how many of you can read ARM assembly, but this is a total nonsense, nonsense uh, code because it's encrypted. So the question is, how do how do you get a decrypted binary? Because you all all I'm going, I'm heading to uh, show you uh, some anal analysis of a binary. But for this, you actually you really need the decrypted binary because uh, there is just nonsense in the encrypted one. So the answer is, you can find find decrypted files on the internet. Uh, I mentioned AppTracker, which I believe is not not operational anymore. But the other ones should be. There is a tool called iResign which will take a um, decrypted binary and resign it with your developer key so we can, uh, you can run it on your developer phone. The another question is, how do these guys who put the things in the, in the internet create the decry decrypted binaries? And the answer is that they use jailbroken phones. And then they just run the, run the application, use the standard kern kernel decryption routines that will decrypt it. Then they will use GDB, pause the process, and dump the memory, which is in decrypted. And that's the way how they, and th again, they as assemble a binary which is decrypted. Uh, I'm going to do a quick comparison with Android, because as you all probably know, Android uses Java. It uses um, Dalvik runtime in a Dalvik virtual machine. It uses APK files, which are mm, basically uh, the equivalent of IPA on, on iPhones. And the the thing with analyzing Android apps is that it's actually Java, which means that Java is, is a language that has been decompiled many years ago. There are decompilers, and there are lots of them of various quality. And I don't know if you actually try to decompile some Java source code, but the results are stunning. Uh, I often find that the result of the compilation of Java is better than the original source code. <laughs> How do you get an APK file on the internet or from the device? There is usually nothing that uh, that keeps you from extracting an APK file. It's it's usually not encrypted. It's usually uh, very easy to extract it even without a rooted device. There is uh, an effort to protect and to to make the analysis harder, and it uses uh, obfuscation, which at at best is questionable because the what you what you lose is is the names of classes and and the names of methods, but uh, what what you you usually have a, l a lot of clues in the analysis that you don't really need these. So to sum it up, uh, getting in a, and the binary is easy. Getting information out of the binary via via analysis is, mm, I guess, for Java, it's it's easy. If it's obfuscated Java, it might be harder. But uh, it, this is also security by obscurity. There is no no edit um, no edit uh, uh, value of the of of the obfuscation according to security. On iOS, it's uh, what you get is ARM assembly, which uh, is the main reason why no one uh, actually bothers analyzing iPhone application because no one actually wants to learn assembly. No one wants to write any code in it. And that's the main reason why developers or reverse engineers, that, that there are so little, so, uh, so little reverse engineers that, that try to dig into iOS stuff. But as I'm going to show you, in I in iOS binaries, you will get a lot of meta information for free. For example, you you pr almost always get the class names and method names, which yes. Oh, uh, these are written in C, right? Okay, then uh, th this is a tough tough one to disassemble, to decompile, and to and to analyze. Mm, this is probably the, the worst thing that you want to analyze because in C you usually don't have any information in the binary at all. 
you can you usually only see I'm going to show a quick demo uh, where you where you will see the results and I will results of recompiling objective C sorry disassembling objective C and I'm going to make a few notes about what will what will it look like if this was C code because objective C is actually C code with a with a thin layer of of some objective objectiveness Modifying an application is a different story. I'm not going to talk about this this uh, today, but uh, it's definitely doable. If you have developer access, it means you can run any app on your phone. Uh, so if you can modify the app, you can you can run it on your phone. Uh, I'm going uh, I'm going to do a quick demo after this slide. I will show you the tool called IDA of the version 6.4. Uh, it's a uh, disassembler. It's I I believe it's the best disassembler in the world because it has lots lots of features for analysis and it helps you really a lot with with the binary analysis. Uh, there's a trial version for macOS which is great because it supports x86 and ARM, which are for me the the only two platforms that I'm interested in, and the trial version works works just fine i will actually use it and have no no really reason uh, to to buy the software because for one it's really expensive and i guess i might not even be able as an individual to buy the software i, I don't really know what the terms are there's another tool called iphone box which is for me a um kind of mysterious software there's another one called i explorer and this software allows you to walk through walk through the files and file system on your device and f uh, i even even modify applications or m modify data in applications which as i think kind of breaks the sandbox i was talking before so i really don't know if uh, th this, this tool is, has been around for I don't know two years at least, and uh, I really don't know how this how is possible that Apple doesn't uh, doesn't this deny this application from working because I believe that this this application this exact application shouldn't exist because for example if you if you have a banking application which stores some data in the documents folder you can just use this tool and extract it. And another tool called Charles, which is a web debugging proxy, which uh, which will show you all the traffic that goes through it, and it also has uh, SSL man in the middle man in the middle um, the techniques to allow you to see the encrypted uh, the data that uh, that the unencrypted data in SSL connections. Oh, sorry, it's not called SSL. It now it is usually TSL, but I guess. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, so if you allow me, I will take a sit. This is uh, IDA. The can, uh, is it is it fine on the on the screen? Okay, I'm going to open. Uh, can I ask you how many of you have ever seen or heard about this tool? Mm, seven. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I'm going to take this binary called uh, rest 2 pub It's an application I made, or it's a uh, it's a mm, binary produced for iPhone so it's in arm and I'm going to open it in this tool and this allows me to it, it detects that it has two two different versions in it one from RV7 one from RV7s I guess in this case they will be probably identical but if I'm go if I open this it will uh, ask me to if if I want to analyze the objective C structures because IDA has a uh, great support for objective C and it will parse parse the binary find all the meta information in the tables and it will mm, really help with the with the analysis
So now, now uh, here it is doing them some analysis, now it's done. And I'm going to take a look at this, uh, at this code here, it's actually ARM assembly. Uh, how many of you can read ARM assembly? I guess no one, <laughs> I can't either. But that's, that's the point I want to make. It doesn't, you actually don't need any or much knowledge of ARM assembly to read the code there is. Because if you take a look, look at, this, uh, at this code, you will find a lot, a lot of clues that can help you tell what is actually going on. This is a method called view did load in class mount view controller. And <laughs> if you take, if you just take a brief look at this code, you can tell a lot of information that's going on in here. You can see that it uses some NSDate formatter, that it, um, for example, for, from these you can see that it calls the super method on view, view load on the, su on the super class, that it uses this string for the data formatter, that it uses this constant uh, for, for the formatter, that it it calls this method this method with with some parameters i don't really care about these but if for from from this one minute i just spent looking at this method i can probably tell quite exactly what it does and i really don't have to know what blx or mofti.w means because the all these all these information is uh, is the result of ida analysis uh, i'd like to show um, the tool called O-Tool, which, which I mentioned before, because it's another disassembler, and this is the, I'd like you to compare this, this assembly with what IDA presented, because this is, this is the difference. This is the real assembly, and it makes no sense to analyze this, because this code is, uh, for this you really need to n be able to read ARM assembly. But, but the IDA can really help with this and f fill in a lot of meta information that's going on in this. It also has uh, what I'm what I'm what I'd like to say is that it's it actually if the if the author of this code is actually a good programmer and uses good programming techniques, <laughs> he makes your uh, your task easier because. It usually means he creates small methods, readable methods in the source codes, which also produce small and readable methods in the disassembly. And it also it, it actually the the worst nightmare of a binary analy analysis is uh, to analyze code which was written by an, by an idiot, because then then <laughs> it's it's hard to read, and it would probably be as well hard to read in the source code. Sorry. Yes. Uh, this this method I'm just looking at is a is a simple method with with no no ifs no force no cycles no conditions. I can switch with the spacebar into a view which which is called um, control flow graph, and here I can see this all this code is in a single block, which uh, means there is no um, no branching in the code. If I take a different method called scroll view, did scroll and switch into this view, I can see here that there, there are uh, at least some branches. I can tell from, a, from this arrow which goes back that this is a loop. I don't know if it's a for loop or while loop because mostly these are uh, from, from the analysis point of view the same. But uh, I, can, I can tell that this code in here is evaluated in some kind of in some kind of loop, and also, if if I'm going to take a quick look on this on the code here, if you if you will ignore these things like auto releasing and releasing uh, objects because you usually don't write this code; it's generated by the compiler. It all comes down to to just the used classes, and with these. Y usually, even without zero knowledge about the assembly itself, you can deduce what's the purpose of the of the function or of the block, and then you can work out to find the purpose of the whole, whole function. 
my point that I'm trying to say is that uh, I personally believe that everyone here who is a developer should at least take a look at some binary to have an idea what really is there, what information you can f find out even when you don't understand the assembly and what information is hidden there. And there are many views, uh, there are many windows in in the in the in this tool. This this lists all the all the view, all the classes and methods. And uh, if I, for example, open this window called string strings, it will find all used strings in the application. So, for example, if um, for example, if you are using Peter's library for encrypting resources then if y if if it uses a symmetric cipher you will find the key in these in these strings probably is that correct <laughs> yes Yes, then you won't. Th then, then you will not find it in th the strings window. But you, uh, if you use a library, a well-known library, you usually know, you usually have a lot of clues that w where you can start looking at. For example, I'm in this application. I am using, uh, I'm using uh, some libraries. For example, this is called I I IBA GCD thing, which, uh, which if I know the library. This is open source. I can I can go take a look in the source code of this, and if it uses some encryption, I will m have a, a really good clue where to start looking for the for the encryption key. Uh, there are uh, one thing I want to show is the imports uh, imports view, which shows all the imported classes functions, and that you are using in the in the binary. One thing that is really cool about uh, IDA is that, for example, if I click on this, it will give me the the, the mm, code where it's where it's used. And if I hit the the X key, it will give me all the references to this place. For example, here I can see that this uses this is the u usage where where it is uh, where this API this important API is used. Or, or actually, this is just a jump to the. And if I uh, hit the X another one, another time here, I will I will find some that this method called open streams uses this API I just found. So, for example, if if you if you find uh, an API which uh, which is which deals with keychain, you will find he it here very easily. Then you can hit the X X key and go to the point where the API is used. And when when we are talking about keychain, this is probably the place where around where you will <coughs> find some interesting encryption information. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna uh, quit the demo, go back to the presentation. Uh, this is just last uh, last two slides, uh, a summary of what I what I'm trying to say. Uh, can I get the mic back? Okay, so I'll just keep sitting. What uh, what can you or we or I do about this? Uh, one, nothing. Two, <laughs> what well, I'm not trying to say that. Uh, it's uh, the all the security you are implementing or not implementing is wrong. I'm saying that probably most of the security libraries, security software, and things that um, that many many people use is security by obscurity, which which means like like obfuscation is one technique, which is exactly this. Um, there are plenty of me of, of mechanisms that try to make binary analysis harder, but I think that uh, what you should take from this presentation is that uh, 
you can analyze binaries you can find information you can find any information that that, that is, is stored there you can analyze the cryptography or security that is used in any product it's just a matter of your determination it you you probably won't be able to you probably have to spend a lot of time with analyzing a binary but if you know what you are looking for you will always find it it's just a matter of time and my another message is to get a realistic point of view don't be paranoid don't think that uh, if um don't think that this th- what i just showed you means that anything can be hacked anything can be uh disassembled that anything uh, is uh, wrongly implemented it's uh, i think it's it's a good thing to have a realistic point of view it means that it's it's fine if you think about security with what's the worst thing that can happen because for example peter mentioned that when someone steals your credentials for banking uh he can steal all your money this sounds terrible but if you actually think about it it's <laughs> it's it's some it's still better than a bullet in the head it's not it's not it's not your death uh and i know that a lot of it guys uh tend to have the paranoid point of view where when they uh, i don't really understand this because security is not is not something that is or isn't it's re- it's always uh some kind kind of um discussion security is really discussion i think that that's the, that's the uh that's the point uh also risk assessment is something that i think anyone dealing with security should take seriously it's not a management only thing so my last statement if you know something if you know to if you want to know something about something just take a look uh, for example the f- core frameworks of iOS are located in on your MacBook in this in this folder just take a look at how something is implemented it's really an interesting read and iFunbox i don't believe this software exists even i have it on my Mac so now is the space for questions Is there a way to intercept uh, inter-application communication? I'm talking about remote view controllers that were uh, added in iOS 6. Uh, do you know how to uh, how to see what's yeah, faster? Yeah, I, I think the best uh, the best way to deal w- w- sorry deal with this is by using a jailbroken phone and GDB or SciCrypt or what's it's called the tool which allows you to uh, inspect modify and do things with a running process i think you won't be able to effectively find something out via static analysis like in ida but i also think this is a hard thing to analyze I know I don't have any t-shirts, but you can still ask. <laughs> <coughs> okay, I think there are no other questions. So. Okay, so thank you very much.